My name is Daniela Boy. I am the uh, lab manager at the User Research Center. My title has changed, but I still manage the URC. Um, I work on a lot of accessibility and UX projects at Harvard Library. Um, and one thing that we've done a lot since the pandemic is doing more surveys, uh, mainly because it's harder for us to do in-person interviews and also um, anything where, uh, you know, it might be challenging to get in touch with users otherwise. Um, so surveys are a good way to collect feedback. Um, it's an easy way to um, just get input for either creating new products, uh, about events. Um, there's lots of other ways you can use Qualtrics. Um, some people use it as forms for, um, you know, intake forms or uh, registering for events. It really depends on what your purpose is for it. But today we're going to be kind of focusing on the survey aspect of it. Um, and just really basic surveys. So we're not doing anything too advanced. Um, we're also not doing reporting in this particular presentation because that will be in our next presentation in a couple of weeks. Um, so to get started, uh, just again, uh, the agenda for this presentation, I'm gonna go over why um, you might wanna create a survey and what you should do and what you should avoid uh, before you even dive into Qualtrics. Then we're gonna go into Qualtrics and I'll do a demo of how to build a survey. And then uh, last, we'll talk about testing and distribution. So um, let's start here and with creating your survey. So why a survey? Uh, there's many reasons why you might want to create a survey, whether it's just to understand your users, um, creating the right solution for your user's needs if you're looking to build a new product or update an existing one providing information and context to stakeholders. So if you are, again, looking to build something new, kind of getting input from users about their needs, um, and then presenting that to stakeholders to get buy-in on going ahead with a project, or uh, reporting with quantitative and qualitative results rather than um, anything that sort of, you know, I, oh, I've, I've heard this a lot of times, you know, anecdotal data sometimes doesn't, isn't really data for the most part. Um, so having a survey where you have concrete um, feedback from users is really uh, helpful for, again, for buy-in, but also just knowing how you're doing. Um, and uh, so what do you want to learn from your users or whoever you're sending this survey to? Uh, you can figure out who your users are. Um, so for example, where they work at Harvard or what their concentration is, how old they are, what kind of things they use, uh, what your users want. Um, so any features that, you know, if, if they're using an existing service and they're missing something, you can find out what features they suggest or what they would improve, what they do. Uh, so if they're using your research tool, what they end up using that for. Uh, whether it's for a project that um, they use for their personal research or if they use it with their team, uh, where they are. Uh, so if you're looking for folks that are local versus international, um, or you know if they use uh, mobile versus desktop, those are questions you can ask too. Uh, what your users own, again, uh, maybe types of equipment or uh, resources they have available, and what users think of your service or product. So if you had an event, how did they like that event? Um, if you offer like a consulting service, just a follow up asking for feedback, um, or um, if uh, you have a product, if they would recommend it to other people. And also understand their awareness of the offerings that you have, whether it's a service or software, for example. Oh, sorry, didn't realize the waiting rooms here. Uh, all right. And then um, you can also understand the usability of features and if people actually understand how to use features within your product, uh, creating or deprecating a service or product. So uh, deprecating is an interesting one because if you're supporting a product that no one's really using much or could possibly be served by another solution by a third party, sometimes it's good to get the feedback before you actually make that decision or kind of explain that's why you're asking these questions. Um, and also intact or feedback forms. So if you're offering like a uh, consulting service or check-in sort of thing, um, it can be helpful to gather feedback prior to meeting with that person. There's a lot of best practices for surveys. Um, I'm not gonna get too into that here, but uh, these resources are very good for creating survey questions. Uh, basically you wanna ask a lot of yes, no questions or anything that can be easily answered. 
Uh, for example, you don't want to ask a question that obviously kind of uh, inserts bias. Uh, so for example, uh, you don't want to ask like, what, who's the best cat in the world and why is it my cat Woody, <laughs> for example, um, because that's obviously biased and no one's going to know how to answer that. Um, so you want to make sure that you're asking questions that people can understand, but also properly answer uh, without any sort of um, uh, bias in the, the way you're asking it. Um, there's also ways that you can uh, ask certain demographic questions. So for example, like if you want to know people's gender identity, uh, age range, or income bracket, there are different ways you can ask those questions to make it more inclusive. Um, and uh, for example, I know a lot of surveys or older you know, um, databases may only ask like male, female, or other. And that's not really inclusive of all gender identities or um, if you have an other option, you should at least have the ability to write something in. Um, but of course, it, it depends on what you're asking. Um, and these resources can help you uh, with creating those survey questions. But again, this is kind of a bigger topic uh, and a little bit uh, much for today's presentation. Uh, we do have some examples from Harvard Library of surveys that we have done, also with some of the research questions that we've asked in our UX wiki. Uh, so for example, uh, here's a recent one about um, student ebook usage. So if you're kind of curious what we're doing at Harvard Library, we put all of this in the UX wiki um, to give you an idea of the questions we ask and how the answers are also uh, scaled. Uh, so for example, before the pandemic, how often did you use ebooks uh, for your academic work in just a few uh, multiple choice uh, or single choice um, options there. Uh, and various other questions that we've asked. And usually when we have those like other or something else, there's a fill in the box here for what they have uh, for an open response. But um, this is a great way to get inspired if you're looking to do a survey with your group um, to see other surveys that we have done with the Harvard community for students and also staff as well. And um, there's also other things you can use uh, Qualtrics for, like creating a form. So this is the purchase request form for Harvard Library. So if Harvard Library doesn't have um, a book, DVD, whatever, journal, whatever that is, um, you look for it in Hollis, it's not there, but you would like to have access to it, uh, you can make this request uh, for the library to purchase it for you. And this was built in Qualtrics. Um, so this is just a pretty basic form with just text fields, a couple drop downs, and um, a couple uh, multiple choice options here too. Um, then there's the feedback form for the library website. This is a really quick one, just a thumbs up, thumbs down. Um, and if you wanted to include extra feedback. Um, so this is another thing that you can do on Qualtrics is if you click yes, um, go to next, it will give you the, the response form. If you go to no, it will just submit it. So there's a lot of different ways you can use Qualtrics, but today, again, we're just kind of focusing on the survey aspect of it. So um, if you've never used Qualtrics before, um, it is free for everyone at Harvard. Um, if you have a Harvard key, uh, there is a website, I believe it's survey tool, uh, qualtrics.harvard.edu, or I think it's also surveytools.harvard.edu. I think they'll both bring you to the right place. Um, if you're in uh, the med school or dental school and also uh, business school, there's a couple different options for you there. Uh, but for everyone else, we're mostly using this uh, link here. And um, Hewitt has more information in their knowledge base about Qualtrics and access at Harvard. So um, if you're curious how to get there, all the instructions are here. And I'm gonna dive right in and do a demo. Um, if you have any questions uh, before I get started, feel free to ask them in the Zoom chat. Uh, but I'm gonna dive right in and go to Qualtrics now. And uh, since I'm always in Qualtrics, I have a bookmark here in my bookmarks bar. That's why I left it up here for you. Um, and one big change that they just made in the last um, week or so is that they have this new landing page when you log in. So if you haven't been into Qualtrics uh, in the last week or so, this is going to look a little different for you. Uh, so on the left, you have all of your projects that you've been working on. Um, also, any notifications that people have shared. A survey with you will be up here at the top, which is excellent. Um, it used to be up here where this little uh, bell icon was, which is still there. Um, and also gives you kind of, uh, regular updates about survey responses too. And any active surveys that are not closed. Uh, so on the left here, you'll see active and closed. 
Um, active ones are ones that are still open and receiving responses. So um, this one's not getting any new responses, but this survey we launched last week and we have 133 responses, which is pretty good. Um, and you can see the week over week response count on that. Um, surveys, it again, it depends if you're using a form or if this is like an ongoing survey to collect feedback. Uh, most surveys are kind of like one or a couple emails out and done, um, but it depends. Um, I think you can customize this a little bit. Again, this is pretty new to me. You can also switch back to the old view if you want, um, but I prefer this one. The one that they used to have was a little bit um, messy, so it's kind of nice to have this little dashboard here for you. Uh, there's also workflows. Uh, so if you have any, um, for example, any surveys that go out, if someone fills an intake form, uh, you can trigger a workflow to have the, a follow-up survey emailed to them if they put their email in on that intake form. Uh, so you can have that automatically run. Um, you don't need to manually do that every time. Uh, and if you wanna create a new survey, it's uh, just down here and create a new project. So to create a survey, you can just go to uh, survey. There are some other options down here. These are more like marketing type things. Um, so XM is experience management. So this can be kind of used for like marketing research as well. Um, generally, I don't really use these, but you can always just create them and delete them if you want to poke around and see uh, what else um, is out there. There's also some other templates down here. Uh, they also have some really great training options. Uh, so Qualtrics Survey Question Tour, which will give you a tour of all the different question types, um, demographic poll, things like that. Um, so I definitely recommend checking these out if you are new to Qualtrics and just, you know, creating a new project and there's no harm in doing it. You can always delete it later or just kind of write test in the, the project name. Still some COVID-19 projects, return to work and remote work. Um, it's interesting because um, I think as Harvard employees, we've probably had a lot of these surveys sent to us um, and other projects down here. So satisfaction and consent forms and things like that. But I'm just gonna start from scratch today. Um, you can also save things in your library um, as well. If you have um, any templates that you wanna reuse for other things. Um, and you know, if you, there's also templates you can download from us in our UX wiki that we've used for questions. But um, if you just wanna get started um, and start from scratch, I'm just gonna title this uh, Wednesday, today is the 13th um, test project. You can always rename your survey later. Um, they have folders um, that you can create as well if you want to put it for like a particular working group or a particular project. Um, you can uh, create it from scratch or import a QSF file, which is like their template one. You can copy it from an existing project or use one in your library. Um, so I'm just gonna just, again, start from scratch. And when you start from scratch, it's gonna start you off with one default question block with a multiple choice question. Um, so just to explain a little bit of stuff here in the UI. Um, so this is your survey area that you're kind of building in here. Um, this is, so when you select a question, uh, you're gonna get this blue box around it. And this is the, uh, the edit question area is where you uh, make the changes to that particular question. There's a lot here. Uh, so by default, you're going to get the multiple choice, but there are other question types you can change to. Um, so, and you'll see down here some of the things change as well. So there's text entry. Um, if you want to put like a instructions or an image, you do text graphic. Uh, matrix tables, if you're asking, um, uh, you know, I like it, I feel neutral about it, or I hate it. And then you can have certain terms over here. Uh, slider is another one where you can kind of rate things on a scale. Form field is if you're asking a lot of uh, open choice questions uh, within one or open choice things within one question. Rank order is a drag and drop. Um, there are ones that are not drag and drop too. If you want to have them rank from like uh, one to 10 or more, it's up to you. Side by side, uh, another more complex one. I don't use this one very often. Um, Net promoter score is another one a lot of folks use. How likely would you recommend uh, to a friend or colleague? Uh, so net promoter score is, or NPS is something that's often used in a lot of marketing surveys. 
um, and it's kind of standardized like this, where it's uh, zero to 10, not likely to extremely likely. Uh, timing, um, this is an invisible one, just shows you how long they've spent on the page. Slider, uh, you know, we have this little, little meter here. Uh, again, some of these are just not really something you'll use a lot. There's file upload, which may be good for like an intake form or if someone wants to send you a screenshot of something. Uh, drill down, uh, heat map, hotspot. There's a lot here, but for the most part, you're not really going to deviate too much from a multiple choice text entry, uh, text graphic. You might put in like a rank order or matrix table, but um, I'm mostly going to focus on these ones today up here. Um, so multiple choice is the one that you're probably going to see the most um, in your surveys. Uh, so you can have it so it select one answer or, or allow multiple answers. Um, so you'll see this change over here from radio buttons to check boxes. Uh, you can increase the amount of choices here. You can always add or delete. Um, and also one thing here that's not super obvious is this edit multiple. What this is is an easy way for you to copy and paste your answers or just type in instead of clicking on each uh, answer uh, field individually. So you can say like uh, pumpkins, uh, oops, and just do a shift return when you want to change a line, squash, uh, acorns, maple leaves. For I'm just thinking of fall. Uh, so you can just uh, do apply, and then it will add those in there. So this is really helpful if you are uh, if you had drafted your survey in like a Google Doc or Word Doc, for example, and you just want to copy paste those in. You can do that easily here, and you can also edit individual ones just by clicking on them if you want. Um, if you want people to specify, um, you know, if you want to put other here but have them write in uh, what they mean by that. Um, you can allow text entry and then it will put this open response field in there. Uh, you can change the size of the text entry if you want it to be large or medium or small. Um, generally small is what you want, unless it's something where you think they're gonna need to explain a lot. But um, generally if from, for how I design surveys, if someone has other and, you know, if it's, if it's a question where they might need to expand on that a lot, um, I might make it so that, um, for example, I'm going to add a new question here. That's just a text entry field. Uh, you can add um, display logic to this. So for this question, if I wanted to say, uh, if you answered other, please explain or something like that. Um, and then display logic, you can say if they select other in question one, then show this question. Uh, so display logic just means like if you select any of these responses, um, you know, there's a lot of other uh, conditional things here. Um, I don't, you know, these these are a little bit more complex. But um, if they don't select a certain thing, you can also have a question uh, come up. Um, but you know, there's there's a few different ways you can do that. Uh, to go back to my multiple choice question, um, you can also use suggested choices. So uh, suggested choices are just kind of automatically generated. Um, if you add or you know remove questions or uh, choices, it'll kind of add more here. Uh, there's a lot of different scales here. So um, again, if you want to do worse to better, difficult or easy, uh, regretful or delightful. These are automatically generated for you. Um, and this can be really helpful if you're just trying to figure out like a scale that works for the way that um, you're asking the question. Um, never and always, none and all, little or much. Um, they're kind of all along the same line of, um, you know, uh, attitude or professional, you know, but um, similar scales, uh, there are some demographic ones that have like ethnicity or marital status, orientation. Um, so I think some of those will, you can't increase or add any more than those, um, but these can be um, helpful um, for you. You can also reverse the order too, if you'd rather have it by most to least or least to most. 
Um, you can only show the first or last if you'd like. Um, it's gonna change depending on like what scale you have here, but um, you can change this to be a drop down if you don't want it to be a list or a select box. Uh, select box is not as straightforward, so I generally don't use that. Um, another thing that you're going to have to think about when you create surveys to use accessibility and also how it will look on mobile or used on a touch screen. Um, so generally when um, there are things like this where it's not super clear, I try to avoid that um, just because it's um, sometimes a little, un uh, we've had users say that, you know, it's, um, it's a little strange <laughs> on mobile, especially. Um, choice groups, I don't really use that much. So I don't, this is something I don't really utilize, um, but I think it can help if you're trying to group certain responses together. Uh, add requirements is, uh, you know, this is a required question or if they leave it blank and they hit next, they'll say, please respond to this one instead if you want request response. Um, it's up to you uh, if you want that and validation, you know, um, I don't really use this either. Sometimes it's useful for like a phone number or an email field where you're looking for specific um, strings or formatting, um, but I don't really use that much either. Um, you can also do skip logic. So kind of different to uh, display logic, you can do skip logic if um, skip from this question to um, end of survey, right? If, if you don't want them to, if they select this, just bump them to the end. Um, so you don't have to keep doing display logic every time. Uh, you can carry forward choices. So sometimes this is helpful if, um, oh, let me get rid of these choice groups, delete this. Um, so usually any answer to, you can just uh, get this little drop down here and remove it. You can also move it up and down if you want. Um, and there's a lot of different things you can do here. Um, but if you want to uh, carry forward choices, so if someone selects um, a certain thing and you want that answer, I use this a lot with open responses too. Um, You'll also get one a question like this in the uh, the brown bag survey that I'll be sending you out later this um, semester. Uh, but if you selected certain events that you attended, it will only ask you questions about those specific events that you attended and not kind of carry over all the other ones. So it can be helpful for that. Uh, choice randomization can sometimes be helpful if you're asking um, certain things like over and over again. So about certain features or certain um, tools someone might use instead of making it so they cl keep clicking like the same options, you might want to randomize it just to keep them on their toes. Um, and there are some default choices too, if you want have to have things selected already by default. Um, there's JavaScript as well, which you can use. Uh, we use this sometimes with the iPad surveys. If you want to have um, a survey time out after a specific amount of time and refresh back to the beginning, we do have some JavaScript code that you can add to your survey to allow that to happen. Um, there's a lot of different customization you can do in Qualtrics. And again, Qualtrics can be used for marketing research, but people also use this for um, psychology research too. So sometimes folks will want to know like where folks are clicking or where, um, how long they're spending on a survey, but these things are usually pretty advanced and honestly more than what you'll usually need for <laughs> a basic survey, but um, Qualtrics also has really great documentation too, if there's anything that um, you're curious about and want to know more. I'm going to go back to my text entry question here. So there's a single line, which is just this one uh, option here. There's multiple lines if you want someone to write several uh, things in there, essay, text box, and password, which will star out anything that they write in there. Um, the thing I find weird about Qualtrics is that when they change this from single line to multiple lines, um, the box doesn't really change. I don't know why that is, uh, but you can just drag and uh, drop that there to be this length. Um, there are, I'm just gonna take this conditioning off here. Uh, you can also, um, just, I was, I'm just trying to remember how I did this. Uh, it's weird because like they, it's only this like drag and drop, which is very annoying. I don't know why this particular question type doesn't have like size <laughs> over here or why it doesn't really change too much. 
Um, I think a lot of this is just if you do like a hard return or um, anything like that. See, now it seems to be adjusting. So that single line to an essay uh, expands a bit, but I find this one a little strange. I don't know why it's a little more complex than the, the multiple choice one, but um, you can add uh, requirements again and validation. This one's pretty straightforward. Um, and then text and graphic. Uh, so if you want to put like instructions or you want to embed a video for someone to watch and then answer questions about, um, you can have the text here. You can also add a graphic. Um, you can upload something. Here's like some Halloween candy, how timely. <laughs> this is the one we always had growing up is the Tootsie Roll Child's Play one, which is my favorite. So um, I like having that image in there. Uh, I think I had a survey once just uh, testing something out and asking people what their favorite candy was. And um, this image is actually pretty helpful if you want to try heat mapping or anything where people click on what they like. Um, there's also file. Again, if you want to have a file for people to download, um, like a PDF or something to view um, and give feedback on, you can do that. Um, and it is a rich content editor, so you can you know, do some formatting and stuff like that. But generally, I try to leave it as default. Um, and also, if you're pasting text in, you know, just do the um, paste and match style so you're not like kind of carrying over any styling from something else, uh, because sometimes that can be a little odd. Um, and so they also break surveys up into blocks. Uh, so by default, you'll just have this default question block. And usually I just write this as like intro. Um, this is more of a way to help you organize, but it can also be helpful for doing display logic too. Um, so you can either skip ahead to a specific block or a question. You can add another block down here. I could put this as like demographic questions. And if you want to move um, something to um, another area, um, you can drag and drop, or you can use this uh, move question option. So you can either put it at the top of the block or before or after. Um, it's up to you how you want to do it. You can delete questions this way, either clicking on this little minus icon to remove the question or just going over here and deleting uh, with the uh, three dots. Uh, this IQ option uh, is just kind of recommendations that the system will just suggest to you. The last question in the survey is descriptive text. Ending a survey with a descriptive text question can be confusing for respondents and lead to lower response rates. Um, so yeah, usually you don't want to leave instructions <laughs> as the last thing on your survey because a lot of people will not click the submit option at the end. Um, and usually you want to have this be a question or kind of explain, you know, what's happening at the end of the survey. And at the end of the survey, when someone submits, this will be the message that they have here, but you can change this as well. Uh, over here, you can either customize this, redirect to a URL, or include their a summary of their responses. Over here on the left is a couple other things that you'll find helpful for creating your survey. So survey flow will kind of give you a visual of how the survey is set up. You can also move the blocks easier here or duplicate them. This is a little easier than doing it in the actual builder option. Um, so if you want to copy areas and just kind of edit them, I find that a lot easier to do. Look and feel. Um, so for our instance at Harvard, there are only a few themes installed, mainly because they don't want to have people creating kind of chaotic things here. Um, and if you want a theme change, you're going to have to email Hewitt for this. Um, this is not something you can control or I can control. Um, so you'll have to go to that uh, survey or Qualtrics to Harvard AD or survey tools page or that um, Hewitt article I mentioned. So uh, by default, you're going to have this regular Harvard University one, which you've probably seen before in other uh, surveys. Um, there are a few other themes here uh, that change the color and some of the text. Harvard Library, we use this particular theme. Alumni Affairs has one. Alumni Association has one. Um, these are some older ones here, too, I think. Um, or just keep it as the default, um, as Qualtrics has it. Uh, but you don't want to be changing this too much. You can modify it to some degree, but generally I say stick with the themes that are here because they are usually accessible and usually they work well on both mobile and desktop. So don't, don't start putting comic sans, don't start putting any, any wild styling on here. Just kind of keep it as is. Um, if you want a theme that you'll use regularly, again, email Hewitt and they can, they can work with you on that. 
and I'll save the changes here. And then these are other options for your survey. Um, this is something that a lot of people kind of skip when they make their survey, but this can be helpful. So if you have a form or something that's going to be up kind of uh, as an ongoing uh, feedback collection thing, you probably want to change your display name in your survey description to explain what this survey is. Uh, so you can say fall feedback form 2021. And you can put a description about this survey. It's Harvard Library wants to know what candy you like for Halloween. Um, this is really helpful if you want this to be searchable by um, search engines like Google. Um, it will also show up on social media posts um, and anywhere that you share it, um, share that link. So, you know, in Slack, when you share a link and it gives you that preview, this is the text that will get drawn in from that. Uh, question numbers can be helpful if you want to know, if you want survey, um, people who respond to your survey to know what number of question they're on. Expert review is, it's weird. It makes it sound like, um, you know, someone's manually doing this, but this is just the AI kind of giving you suggestions with like that IQ thing I showed you. You can change the language too, if you'd like. Uh, responses, um, sometimes I, I do put a back button in, especially if it's something uh, we're asking a lot of open response things and someone may change their mind about something or maybe they answered something already and they want to go back and, you know, cut and paste uh, that in another box. Um, if you're using anything with survey flow elements or, um, you know, display logic, this may not work properly, but um, it's a nice thing to have, especially if it's a pretty long survey. Um, also, this option too, this is on by default, but uh, allow respondents to finish later. Again, if it's a long survey, you want to give them the option to come back to it at another time. Uh, error messages, if anything's missing from um, your required messages or um, the request response, you can change what it says. Uh, incomplete survey responses. So um, this is helpful if you have a long survey, but you still wanna keep anything that um, people filled out before they finished. Sometimes this can be really helpful. Again, if your survey is super long or you know, folks forgot, I do find it helpful, especially for open responses. Um, even if they didn't finish the survey, getting the, the information that they already filled out is pretty handy to just have on, on there. Um, and this kind of ties also with the finish later. So this will just kind of be a timeout on the survey. Either you can have it you know, record those information or just throw it out. Um, and usually I give it, you know, 72 hours or a week. I don't leave it for <laughs> three, month, three months to a year. That's pretty generous. Um, I don't think you want to leave that very long. Um, and, you know, you can kind of change this when either they started or when they last finished it. Um, if you want your survey to end at a specific time. So, for example, if you're accepting applications for something uh, like a grant or, um, you know, people to participate in a particular activity, you can have it expire at a certain time and to start at a certain time. Um, most surveys I do, I leave open to collect responses then close it manually, but it's up to you uh, what you wanna do and it, it really depends on what you're using it for. Uh, inactive survey message, uh, by default, it'll just say the survey is no longer active or no longer uh, accepting responses, uh, but you can um, have a manual uh, option here too if you wanna change that, if you wanna have them go to like a different website or learn more. Uh, security, uh, if you want to have it be invitation only or open anyone, uh, password protection. Uh, most of these I don't really use. You may want to use bot detection if you're, if you have a, like a survey that's ongoing and accepting responses. Um, prevent indexing. So you may want to have an index by Google if it's a form you want people to fill out um, on a regular basis, but by default, this is on. Uh, require permission to view uploaded files um, and anonymize responses. So this one can sometimes be helpful too if you don't want their IP address or location info. Um, and post survey, you can have a follow up email. Um, you can have email triggers go out if um, they answer certain things. If you want to follow that up with them, you can tie it to Salesforce if you have this uh, or have Salesforce. Um, there's a whole bunch of options here. Uh, you can add scoring to specific answers. Uh, so if you want to say like this one's worth 80 points and this one's worth blah, blah, blah. Um, it's up to you. Uh, what else? Go back here. Quotas, if you only want like 100 people to fill this out and that's it, you can set the quota for it. 
uh, and translation if you want to translate it into other languages. Um, I'm going to quickly just go over these other tabs. I'm not going to get too into um, how these work. Uh, so workflows, as you saw on the, on the dashboard at the beginning, you can have several workflows enabled. So if, again, if someone um, has like an intake form and you want to have them automatically get a follow-up form a few days later, uh, you can set up a workflow for that. Distributions is another thing that I find this weird that they put this in another tab. Um, I guess there's different reasons why you might want to have it in another tab, but this is how you distribute your survey and this is how you get your link for it. Um, so you can have it emailed um, or you know, put it on a website. So like a, a you know, library feedback form is on the website, you can share it on social media. Um, there's SMS or other apps or create a QR code for it. Um, online panel, I'm not sure what this is. Oh, okay. This is something that we don't have on Harvard, but I guess if you want to send it out to um, a group of users to get information. Uh, but typically, you're going to use the anonymous link. Uh, I often use this in my um, when I share out surveys, especially in email. Um, so normally, I'll just create an email campaign and you know either Mailchimp or Outlook and just send it out uh, with a link to this survey. You can copy that, and then it'll be ready to go. Um, and downloads. I don't know. What... Some of these are features I just don't ever use. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, but you can get like QR codes and things like that if you want to print it on a flyer. Um, honestly, I just, yeah, QR code, I mean, it can be helpful for these because sometimes the links that they generate are not super, um, super uh, easy to, <laughs> easy to say because uh, it's a big string and it's also a lot of um, lower capital letters and things like that. But uh, once you collect your data, um, you'll have the data analysis and reports that you can create. I'm not, again, I'm not going to get it too into this because um, Amy will be covering this in a couple of weeks in her presentation. I'm just going to quickly go back to the survey tab here. Uh, so another thing in your survey is this IQ score, as we saw down here, this little IQ icon. You can always click this, and this will give you um, a scoring on your survey based on recommendations um, and also have options to change things. Um, this is only a two-question thing, so there's not a lot here. Uh, but one thing I do want to point out um, here, uh, preview, is the preview option. Um, so here you can see what it looks like on both desktop and mobile. Uh, one thing that you want to do here uh, to make sure that your testing uh, answers don't get counted in your uh, final reporting is do the ignore validation. Um, uh, so if you want to uh, just make sure things work and you don't want to use the um, mm. display logic the way you have it, you can do it that way. You can view the public version or scan the QR code. You can turn the mobile view on and off. Uh, you can place a bookmark at a specific part of it if you want to remember um, or if you got distracted and you just want to come back to it later. Uh, Qualtrics does time out after a while for your Harvard key login. Um, it's pretty quick, if I remember, it's like an hour or two. So if you are creating a survey and you come back to it, you may get kicked out. So using that bookmark option can be pretty helpful. If you delete a question, it'll be down here in the trash. Uh, you can always bring it back. Um, this can be helpful if you are kind of editing as you go. And if you want to publish, you just go here. It'll give you that anonymous link here as well. And you can um, change your version history if you'd like. Anytime you create a survey and make a change, you need to hit the publish option. Uh, that is the save option for this. Uh, so you want to make sure you do that every time. There are other tools up here that, um, again, these kind of get hidden sometimes. Uh, so the auto number, auto number questions. Uh, so every time you create a question, it's just going to add another number to that. So it'll be a Q1, Q2, Q3, blah, blah, blah. If you delete one, you know this is still Q2. But if I make a new question here, um, uh, let's see, add a new question. It's going to go Q, Q1 to Q3. So when you report um, or export your data to like out of um, Qualtrics, like Excel, for example, it's going to go Q1 to Q3. And that can be kind of confusing. So one other thing I recommend when you are ready to launch your survey is just do the auto number questions. Uh, you can either do sequential numbering or block numbering, or up, it's up to you. But Definitely do that. That's like the, one of the last steps I recommend you do. Um, you can generate test responses. You can review. Um, one thing here that is very important 
that I think also comes up on the IQ thing, but I also recommend you do this before you send it out, is check accessibility on your survey. Um, because you can change the next and previous buttons to something instead of, you know, arrows, change the default survey title, which I did, number of the questions, and enable the option to show export tags. Um, there are certain question types that are not super accessible, and I'm going to go back to my presentation for this. Um, but for anything, as I mentioned before, that, you know, is requires a mouse to use, um, again, these will also look kind of weird on mobile, so you'll see here. Um, it's a slider, but I, this, this is just strange. It looks weird on mobile. So um, it, it, for accessibility, it's important, but also we have a lot of mobile users, especially if you're working with undergrads. Many of them are answering these on their phone or tablet um, using touchscreen devices. So you want to make sure that you're using things that are easy to understand uh, without having to put like instructions here. Uh, you can also change the format on some of these to make them a little bit more um, accessible. So I just have this to be, you know, radio buttons instead. Uh, personally, I just use the text box and say like rate, rate, like rate from one to five. Um, I just find that's easier to to do instead of you know trying to make it too complex. Uh, but um, again, yeah. So this one also is very confusing. So. Always preview, always try these things out on both, you know, see, this is getting cut off on mobile too. You don't want to have horizontal scrolling on mobile, so don't use this, <laughs> basically. Um, there's a lot of best practice things that you'll, you'll kind of um, learn over time, but um, I'm going to go back to my presentations. That's, that's about it for the demo here. Um, so yeah, again, question types to avoid in Qualtrics. There's a really great article um, that the University of Colorado put together about Qualtrics accessibility. Uh, but there's different matrix questions. Um, there's different sliders, hotspot, heat map. Um, they just don't really work well either with screen readers or mobile devices. So avoid them if you can, or just try to find an alternate way to ask the question. Um, and you can also save your templates and question blocks. So you can, um, for example, if you have a list of all the Harvard schools, this, this is one I use pretty frequently. Um, instead of having to manually copy paste that every time, just, just save it as a question that you can um, import anytime. Same with any demographic things. Um, this will make it a lot easier for you if you want to compare things year over year or um, you want to compare different surveys, um, either having you know students' concentrations or their school or anything like that is really helpful. Also, like status, whether they're you know undergrad, grad, alumni, fellow postdoc, <laughs> all the different options you can be in Harvard. Um, so Qualtrics, again, has a really great article about how to do this, um, but take advantage of it. It's really helpful. Save yourself the time. If you can save yourself the time, then do it. Um, additional help with Qualtrics is on their knowledge base. Um, there's also other resources, so ebooks and case studies. Um, again, I also recommend when you create that new project, try some of those templates that I showed you um, in there, and that will be really helpful for you to, um, to kind of poke around and see what's available. The other thing is distributing your survey. So test it, test it, test it. Use that accessibility checker absolutely every time. Recode those questions. Uh, use the publish and preview option, as I showed you, to see how it's going to look on both desktop and mobile. And um, in the distribution tab, you can get that link, QR code, or email it. Um, and also, make sure you pilot the survey with someone on your team. I would also pilot the survey with someone else who's on your team that may not be familiar with the survey, um, so that you can make sure that they, um, the branching's working, checking for any um, errors in spelling or you know, the answer options, but also just making sure that the questions you're asking are clear. If it's not clear, um, you'll probably get, you know, people asking, what does this mean? Um, all that. <laughs> uh, make sure you test it, test it, test it, test it before you send it out. Because um, if you ask something in a confusing manner or it's just not very clear, it's going to make your data analysis very hard. Um, I would also say don't do too many open-ended questions because that also makes, uh, you know, uh, data analysis very hard. Um, don't make a super long survey either. So if you test with someone and they're spending like 20 or more minutes on the survey, it's probably too long. Um, I would suggest making two surveys in that case, like a follow-up survey with from the first one that you sent out. 
Um, I try to keep the surveys so they're less than 15 minutes to complete, uh, mainly because you're going to end up with a lot of incomplete surveys if you make it too long. Um, and try not to ask more than, you know, 10 or 15 questions. Um, it's, you might want to know everything, but do you really need to know everything <laughs> is the other thing. And also, do you want to make this a really big pain for you to analyze later on? So keep it manageable. Don't, don't ask every question under the sun. Just, just, you know, just get a, get a general idea of the question or, you know, the questions you're trying to answer. Um, but you don't need to know everything. And I'll, honestly, in demographic questions too, don't ask it unless you absolutely need it. Because oftentimes it's like, what, what does my gender have to do with uh, <laughs> the feedback I'm giving about this service, right? Um, or what does my income bracket have to do with it? Don't ask it if you don't need it. Um, it also really helps to incentivize your audience to take your survey. Um, so we have a lot of luck with doing raffle prizes, uh, whether it's Amazon gift cards or things like a Fitbit or Kindle, things like that. Um, also, if it's like an in-person survey, um, you can have snacks or coffee, like fill out the survey and you'll get a free coffee or donut or whatever, or branded swag items. Uh, this, is, <laughs> this is a really good thing, especially during orientation time where people are on a spree to get <laughs> every Harvard branded thing they could possibly get. Um, so it really helps to kind of give someone incentive to do this survey. They're giving you your time, so you should kind of give them compensation for that too. Um, you can always add, you know, surveys get more responses if you have that carrot there to um, incentivize someone to actually spend that time. There are various ways you can share your survey out. Um, so email lists, whether it's half, uh, house lists, staff facing lists like ABCD or at Harvard Library, we have HL comms for our staff. Um, email lists outside of Harvard. So if you're looking for a UX group, there's like UXPA, uh, local organizations, just make sure you have permission to email that to, to those groups. Um, there's Slack groups, whether it's for FAS, Harvard Library, Harvard UX group, or UXPA Boston. Um, you can put it on your social media, uh, previous attendees from events. Um, we also have a student pool at the User Research Center. If you want to email undergrads or graduate students, we have students from all different schools and concentrations in there, so um, we can help you with that. And if you're unsure, you can ask us. We've sent out plenty of surveys for different reasons for Harvard Library, and we can give you lots of advice on that. Um, don't be discouraged if you don't get a lot of responses. So this is a screenshot from my inbox uh, with lots of surveys. Uh, I just typed survey into my Gmail, and this is over the course of like a week or so, um, all the different emails that have a survey in them. So a lot of folks get a lot of surveys. Um, you probably receive many of them as well. I know every time I shop at CVS, I pretty much get a satisfaction survey sent to me. Um, you know, thinking about your subject line, if you're sending out an email, can be really helpful and also what you put in your email. Um, you know, if, if there's like an incentive here for, uh, you know, getting a gift card, I usually say like win a gift card in there. The one I liked here is random quick question like quick question or um, super quick trailer survey. And these are usually like things that take less than five minutes to do. Um, inviting you to a special survey about creativity, culture, and community. Yeah, and then and this one also says, we know you receive a lot of surveys. <laughs> so, um, you know, definitely give people the idea of how um, quick that survey is, how much time it's gonna take for them to finish that, um, and also kind of what the survey is about. You could do um, surveys in person. Uh, this has not been something we've done a lot during the pandemic, but fingers crossed, maybe we'll be doing this more in the spring. Um, capturing feedback either, either at points of service like desks or exits or at events um, like tours, events uh, for staff or students, things like that. Um, you can set up a table where your audience hangs out in between classes or meetings. Uh, we always find a lot of luck in the Science Center because that's pretty busy with Clover in there. Uh, bring incentives. If you have a bunch of keychains or umbrellas and things like that, people are generally drawn to that because people like free stuff. <laughs> um, and we have a list of on-campus locations. Um, this, this was from pre-pandemic, so I don't know how many of these are still allowing this right now or if they will in the future because things are kind of in flux, but um, we've had, we have some um, in a spreadsheet there where we've, we've had luck before. Um, and this is over at the Science Center in the Cabot Library um, Science uh, Discovery, uh, Cabot Discovery Bar. This is right in the entrance. So once you go in the library, this, this large curvy table is there. 
um, they have this projector that projects into the library and out into the science center. Um, and if you say, take a survey, win a Fitbit, or get snacks, it generally uh, brings people in. So um, just bringing some laptops and iPads can be helpful. Um, and then for iPad surveys, you can add a timeout option for incomplete surveys, um, loop back to the beginning and hide the next and back buttons and powered by Qualtrics. And uh, there's JavaScript and template available in the wiki. And these are just some examples we've used at Harvard Library. We put one in Widener uh, for creating a survey uh, or taking a quick survey about using the items in the Widener stacks and also a check-in one at the URC. You can also use this for like usability testing. So if you have a printout of instructions and just have someone go through the survey on their own with an iPad. Um, and we have iPads and laptops available at the URC when we are open. We are still closed, um, but uh, hopefully again in the spring, we will have iPads and laptops for you to borrow if you want to do uh, on-the-spot testing. Uh, and reporting the results. So you're probably wondering, what do we do with this data once we get it? Uh, so again, Amy's doing a presentation in a couple of weeks uh, where you can have your survey says moment. Um, you could be the Steve Harvey of your team um, and tell people what the results were and how um, to show that in Qualtrics. 